Hi guys, Zach here. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. This gives you access to over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, and Kindle, as well as an MP3 player. Right now, I'm reading Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke, and the making of a masterpiece by Michael Benson. But Audible users can also access other film books, such as Hank and Jim, The 50-Year Friendship of Henry Fonda and James Stewart by Scott Iman, or Five Came Back by Mark Harris. Again, the link to get your 30-day free trial is www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. One more time, www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. Now, on to the show. Welcome to episode 201 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with Lydia Creech, Michael O'Malley, and Malcolm Baum. And in today's episode, we will be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series. Finally, it's been a while, uh, with 1955's Kiss Me Deadly in part two. But in part one, we're going to be re- reviewing two relatively new releases. The first one is First Reformed, and the second one is Incredibles 2. Uh, but I kind of wanted to go ahead and just jump into the review of First Reform, which is one that I feel like a lot of people um, associated with the podcast have been seeing periodically over the, the last month or so. Uh, and know friend of the pod darren hughes caught it at tiff i believe last year but this is the latest film from writer director paul schrader and it stars ethan hawk as this priest of a small congregation in upstate new york who is kind of having a crisis of faith after a uh, a a couple comes to him with concerns about the future of the environment and whether or not god is going to forgive us for what we've done to the environment uh but there's a lot of other stuff that he's dealing with you know that's making him anxious at the same time um, Michael, I kind of wanted to start with you. I, I thought I liked your review of the film on Letterboxd, and it seemed like you had some really uh, clear thoughts on on how you felt about this movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. Um, until Hereditary, it was going to be probably a shoe in for my favorite movie of the year. Uh, it's kind of another story. Um, but yeah, I thought it was great. I'm a huge fan of Bergman and specifically Winter Light, and so this movie's channeling that really heavily. Um, I mean, until a certain point in the movie, it, it is like beat for beat, winter light, just in a modern context, essentially. And I, I was a little bit unsure of how I felt about like just how closely it was hewing to that inspiration, but I think in the end it ends up paying. I, I feel like the, the Bergman influences kind of goes along with a lot of the other influences that Paul Schrader's, you know, known for not only just because of his essay that covers Ozu and Brisson and Dreyer, but also, you know, he's talked extensively about the influences of those directors on the film. Uh, Malcolm, you, you've watched some of Schrader's work leading up to this. What I guess, what, what did you make of First Reform and how did it kind of compare to some of his other stuff? Well, uh, First Reform kind of feels like the movie he's been trying to make for a while because uh, I actually saw this and it inspired me to go back on some of his earlier works. Uh, Stuff like American Gigolo and Light Sleeper and, you know, to a certain extent, uh, Taxi Driver, even though he didn't direct that, um, has been, you know, reaching for like this kind of... uh, Brissonian quality, but never quite going all the way with it. Just kind of taking, you know, little influences here and there. And this is where he kind of, you know, he, he, uh, he goes all in and, uh, I think it works, uh, you know, very well. And I think this movie's kind of firing on all sin- cylinders. I mean, just the, the austerity of it alone, um, is kind of chilling just kind of the, you know, the empty frames we see, you know, Hawk and Habit and stuff like that. And um, it really, it, it, this being, you know, a film made by an older guy completely makes sense. And uh, I'm glad he finally got to do it. Yeah. And starring an older guy, I think that, you know, Ethan Hawke is, he, he's known for, uh, you know, the before series training day. Yeah. A lot of stuff, but I feel like this role especially is, is, kind of a, a little bit of, of a different ilk from the rest of his stuff. It, I, I listened to an interview that uh, Schrader and Hawk did on Fresh Air, and they talked about how uh, Schrader kind of described 
what he wanted out of Ethan Hawke as as a lean back performance. He he kind of was going, you know, you you usually try to fill in uh, empty spaces in movies with with charisma and, and charm, and that's fine. But for this, whenever you have that feeling, you know, I want you to recoil, and you can kind of feel that because uh, Hawke's character Tuller uh, or Taller, he he. he it's weird because I it was he was somebody I was you know interested in and and drawn to, but at the same time he, he didn't it's it wasn't like it was based on his you know charismatic personality or anything. It's just he there was just something some aura deep inside him that was kind of drawing you in. I mean, what did what did you guys make of of his performance? Well, yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a wonderful performance, and it really kind of attest to the Bressonian quality because Bresson was a director famous towards the later end of his career, making uh, actors do maybe, you know, near 20 takes to where he said, I don't want the actor to, you know, implement anything from the lines they're reading. I just want them to read it and for it to be as is. And that's not quite, uh, Schrader doesn't go quite as far in first reform, but like, um, yeah, I mean, Hawk is asked to do a lot, like a lot of like tight close-ups, almost kind of Bergman type close-ups. Um, and, uh, you know, he, it's shown all in the face, all in the, the recoiled pain he's doing. So I think Hawk is asked to do a lot and I think he hits it out of the park. I think there's, I think he's still got some of his charisma there too, though, because like, sure. I mean, if we're comparing this to a lot of other uh, Schrader protagonists, like, um, I don't know, like uh, Travis Bickle and, and Taxi Driver, I guess is the most obvious analog. There's like a real distance from the performances in those, right? We're kind of viewing these characters like under a, under a microscope um, and we're, we don't really, uh, we understand what their mind is like, but we're not asked to inhabit that mind. Whereas I feel like Ethan Hawke's performance is almost, at least for me, it was inviting me to, um, to really identify myself in him, as, you know, and I think, you know, to a certain extent, maybe that happens for some people in other Paul Schrader movies. Um, but this was the first of his protagonists that I really felt like, to a certain extent, we're supposed to identify with this character. And, and there's maybe a point in which we're not, but it gets really complicated for me um, as it goes on because a character who I strongly identified um, takes such a turn later on. And I think Ethan Hawke's performance is, is largely... Uh, responsible for that just because he's got this even as even as a priest uh, and this kind of you know really reclusive and and you know prickly priest there's and maybe I'm just bringing some of my baggage like remembering his before trilogy stuff but like I I look at that guy and he seems he seems not like this kind of like solitary like uh, totemic character and more like just a guy who's scared and alone and that felt like more more inviting to me and and kind of a lot of sympathy is the wrong word but there's i think there's a lot to to like about hawk's performance lydia you caught this movie yeah, twice totally. now I'm, I'm curious what was what what was i guess your initial reaction the first time you saw it and then the second time did, did anything change did you you know gain any appreciation or i guess lose any <laughs> any, any you know any feelings toward it at all no, on the I second time? No, I think my feelings toward it have actually grown. I know the first time I went to go see it, I was pretty excited based on Nathan's written review for our site talking about you know religious themes and religious guilt. Cause, and I'm not like a Bresson Ozu Berkman person, so I did not have that basis of comparison. And what just struck me the first time was how... how uh, Malcolm, you use the word austere, but it's like oppressive and dread inducing. Like, this is what I think people who are heaping praise on hereditary <laughs> were probably feeling because, yeah, you have this overt struggle, uh, Ethan Hawke's personal struggle, but also it's like, oh no, humans fucked the planet up real bad. <laughs> and like, that's actually <laughs> this is actually something worth <laughs> so you examining yourself and your role as an audience member and i can feel how i like i feel like i feel paul schrader reaching out and like trying to shake the audience uh and then the second time i watched it i was just really struck by how formal it is and how great the compositions are uh 
it's shot in uh, academy ratio, so that's slightly different. And Schrader makes like great use of the frame and just positioning people like right in the middle of it, and you feel like you you can't they can't get away from you or the camera, and it's like eh. <laughs> maybe you deserve to be examined this way. Yeah, totally. And I, I feel like the. You know, speaking of the 4.3, it might have been easy to shoot this on film, but I'm kind of glad he didn't. I feel like the digital aspect kind of works. I feel like if it was shot on film, it might be too overbearing in a sense. I mean, and not to get ahead of ourselves, but like uh, same with the ending, kind of the ending being a somewhat positive note, you know, possibly. Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> uh, not, not exactly as depressing as, you know, the rest of the movie. This isn't, you know, a popcorn classic or anything like that. But um, what if... No, yeah. The things that happen with like both screen, more so the first screening because it was newer, but like listening to the audience kind of murmur at the end about the ending, like, oh, did this really happen? What at what point did it diverge from reality, or how are we supposed to take it? I'm like, I don't think it matters whether no, it, totally doesn't. it really happened because <laughs> obviously it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Schrader himself. Uh, so says yeah, it I, <laughs> just like t- don't take it at like a literal level this is happening <laughs> to go back to the digital stuff um i really dug the digital photography and i it added to the austerity in in this way that digital does really well where it looks really bleak and austere and has this like weird ugliness to it um but at the same time is really really compelling to look at um and like there's a few shots in particular like when there's a shot near the end of the movie where Ethan Hawke is, and this has been used in a lot of the promotional material, where Ethan Hawke is at the, it's like a harbor or something that's been abandoned. and It's like a waste this, site? Oh no, you the with the purple. Yeah, and it's like all purple, and it looks like, like it's not this purposefully ugly and glitchy, but it looks like a, a little bit glossier version of like what, like, you know, 21st century Godard movies are trying to do with digital photography or something. Just this, this weird, distorted color. No, oh, totally. And one one thing, this I don't know how it, this connects maybe overall to the you know ultimate theme of the movie, but just one thing I noticed that kind of interested me is like I don't know a film versus digital guy. I like I like that argument. Um, you know, uh, Toller, the you know the hot character, this guy. You know, he's very uh, committed to the analog. You know, writing in the you know the journal. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. which is which is straight from Diary of a Country Long Priest, hand. you know, works, works well in this movie. And um, the truth that he eventually discovers, which ultimately, you know, destroys him, is a uh, digital, you know, he finds it through the laptop. And those scenes where he's, you know, he's just being shocked by these, these images he found online or some of the more effective images in the movie. It almost kind of like some horror movie type feelings to, to these images as he's just you know, a gape looking and at like the a, thing, you know, a suicide The only thing he post. can do to get away from is like slam the laptop close. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I feel <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> exactly. Lydia, going, kind of going back to, to you seeing it a second time, uh, the ending for me was was it's it's truly evocative. And I don't know, it, it didn't necessarily, um, I kind of was a little unsure of my feelings about it uh, at first, but I've, it's kind of really won me over, at, you know, after, you know, nearly a week of thinking about it. Um, I guess, what was it like going in the second time, understanding where the arc of the film goes? I mean, does that does that change anything in how you approach where this movie ends up? Um, it actually makes me appreciate, I think I appreciated it more the second time I saw it, because the first time I was a little bit, annoyed by Amanda Seyfried's character being literally the Madonna. She's named Mary. She's with child. And I was like, okay, Paul Schrader, I see what you've done. But <laughs> I think the second time knowing that's where it was going, um, I think I was able to f- follow Toller a bit more and like be a little bit more sympathetic to how he was seeing Mary and desperately trying to use her or reach out to her or like have some sort of connection. Um, so I don't know. I still don't know if I see it as hopeful necessarily. Uh, it's, I guess it's, I don't know. And this kind of like 
cat criticism, but it's just like, I don't know how else the movie could have ended. Because if, right. if it ends with him killing himself or getting arrested, stuff like that, that's just too bleak. That almost kind of changes the whole tone I, of the entire movie. I mean, I so, still think he killed himself. <laughs> he's dead. <laughs> If we I was see, gonna say, we it's see him, not off the okay. table that he's killed himself. He just didn't, yeah, you know. Too... Ouch. That's yeah. apparently how the original screenplay ended. Uh, Schrader, Schrader's last shot apparently was going to be Ethan Hawke's character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Check off Can, can I spoil and say what the, what the <laughs> Spoiler alert. Was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but he was going to... The, the last shot apparently was going to be him drinking That's the Drano and then falling out of the frame. Um, I really like the shot of oh, him throwing yeah. it to the ground, though. Like that. Yeah, when it like, drops, it's great. It, it like, like splashes upward in this kind yeah. of cool way. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tuller was like, oh, God. I don't know. Tra- I mean, Schrader's ultimately a pessimist. I mean, I feel just delving mm-hmm. through his film work. And if I believe it was Scorsese who told Schrader, like, with this ending, it's like, it's got to be a different ending. So I think that's. That's a great. <laughs> like you can't do that's that. That's a great like Scorsese <laughs> sensibility. Someone who's kind of enjoyed the splendors of Hollywood a little bit more than Schrader, kind of giving him like the heads up, like this this might not work. <laughs> um, one last thing before we, we move on, I'm I'm curious what you guys made of some of the 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 supporting characters, uh, such as Cedric the Entertain- Entertainer as this uh, leader of the mega church that uh, Ethan Hawke's priest is is kind of a, a leg off of, uh, and then you also have this character Esther who is uh, clearly has some history. Yeah, but, it, but, but she and she clearly has some history with Ethan Hawke's character, and uh, is this is this choir leader for the for the mega church? Um, you have this kind of this this medley of, of different side characters behind this very you know mm-hmm. monolithic performance. I mean, what did you make of, of of some of those characters and kind of what they added to the to the overall story? Esther to me is the weak link. Uh, she yeah. almost feels like a like I mentioned the. Winterlight yeah. connection earlier, and she feels almost like a a leftover from Winterlight, you know, which is <laughs> you know, like her char- her analog in Winterlight plays a very central role, but in this movie, Amanda Seyfried's character kind of takes what happens with the Esther character. I can't remember what she what her name is in Winterlight, and uh, uh, Amanda Seyfried ends up being kind of the the you know the foil for. Uh, the priest instead of the Esther character, and in the end, I, she's got some interesting back and forths with him. But I, I don't know that as a character, she's really adding to. Yeah, him. I guess it, like him, like connecting with the Cypher character it makes sense. Like you know, they're both people stricken by loss and stuff. You know, and stuff like that. It makes sense. But like, yeah, I feel like the Esther character is ultimately mm-hmm. you know, a little bit mistreated. You know, it's kind of a very one-dimensional character and stuff like that. And well, in the last interaction they have, he just like, shouts at her, and then we just see her sing the the hymn at the end, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, I agree. Right? She's, kind of, she's kind of built up to be broken down ultimately, yeah. which is you know that's not great. Yeah. Um, and just like a prop for Ethan Hawke's character to show, like, oh, he's turned a bad queen, yeah. guys. <laughs> Yeah, it, it seems it seems more like she's just kind of there to be a yeah. barometer to show you how far Ethan Hawke's character is, fa- you know, falling deeply into into this whole thing. And I just feel like it probably that could probably been sh- shown in a in a better way than rather just using a character to to be beaten up, kind of, you know, <laughs> pretty much. I, a side character that I really liked was the CEO of. Bulk Industries, because I no, I think one of the most effective scenes in the movie, or one I really related to, was in the diner. And, yes, uh, Toller like briefly tries to breach the climate change, and he talks about the scientists. Don't make it and political. just the way <laughs> the way the CEO just like snaps and turns on him and shouts him down and is like, "Take care of your own backyard first And like I've had that interaction with people. Oh, totally. And that 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 matched up with like the biking scene after is is pure relief, you know. I think that, that mm-hmm. that's a great sequence of scenes that like make sure that that the movie is not so oppressive, you know. It is, you know, in a way very one dimensional as like these kind of monolithic character studies tend to be. But like Schrader, you know, throws in dark humor at parts, you know, and just moments of relief to where it's not as oppressive as you know this movie could be if, in other hands. Well, in that one scene in the diner, like, 
Mm-hmm. There's a lot about this movie that really feels like a, it has a finger to the pulse of like where American Christianity yes. is currently. Yeah. And yep. that scene in particular feels like ripped out of so many different interactions I've had regarding different, you know, uh, evangelical friends I have or whatever, where there's this kind of weird dichotomy between if there's either faith or politics. And for some reason mm-hmm. on certain issues, if you bring, you know, some sort of like contemporary political sensibility into it, you're compromising faith or you're sidelining faith for politics you've brought politics into your faith um you know where i think faith is deeply political yeah yeah as hawk's character i think rightly points out like a lot of these things are really central to like what christianity and evangelical christianity claim to find important so why is it Mm -hmm. bad to you know bring it up in a modern political context and it's it's so i just like trying to point out an issue that you know is wrong but not being able to penetrate either like layers of scripture or someone else's self-defense they've built up to protect their own ego like i'm not destroying the environment you're the one who had a political funeral (laughs) like what no i can't (laughs) right so well i like that his first grievance is that he played a neil young song that was uh (laughs) (laughs) neil young protest songs (laughs) yeah and it is, and this movie is great at like, you know, it could be very easy just to condemn religion as a whole. But, you know, Schrader was raised Calvinist mm-hmm. and it does a great job of I mean, our, our main character is a deeply religious man himself. And we're asked to, uh, you know, sympathize and empathize with him. I also him. think he does so throw it, in criticisms of him just a little bit. I think no, totally, look, totally. through Cedric, the entertainer's uh, character, who's, yes, like clearly in the wrong about some things, but also... <sighs> I don't think he's not a bad person. Is he? <laughs> well, I I mean, it's kind of it's kind of he kind of toes the right. line. He does what we all do in our daily life and kind of turn a blind like eye. Like makes compromises. <laughs> mhm. And yeah, and I guess that's what's radical about mm-hmm. Toler is that he kind of internalizes, you know, the world's strife and uh, you know, he does not want to take any more compromises, which is that's a powerful feeling yep. right there and ultimately cannot be tackled alone and that's why you know he makes the decisions that he does but um yeah i think cedric the entertainer is a he just a great side character and it's it's a it's like a, i remember schrader saying that it might be i don't know but he's like if i hired like some old white guy like you would have just hated that character you know um schrader said that himself and like it's true like to make to make this character likable is kind of it makes you know, the whole situation make a little more sense, you know, why there's more people at a, like his at church. Mega church. Mega old, churches make me so uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. It's the, it's American culture meeting religion, which is, you know, that's, that's rough. Well, and I think one thing that's so great about that character is he could have very easily been a terrible mm-hmm. character in a, in a very uncomfortable way. You know, the black mega church pastor is, would be a very easy, uh, you know, I guess straw man to, to kind of, you know, joust at, you know, if you're, you're going to like condemn contemporary American Christianity and the, you know, the prosperity gospel of, of mega churches. And I think having him a person of color makes it a very tricky line for the movie to, to walk. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it ends up pulling it off pretty well just because he's so, for the most part, a a very likable character in in a lot of ways and, and actually cares about Toller. Well, First Reformed is in theaters now. I think I think it's safe to say we all recommend if it's playing near you to definitely go and, and check it out. It should, you know, it's highly recommend. Yeah, it, it's it's, yeah. it's yeah. definitely my definitely favorite. Definitely go movie. and then save some time afterwards. To just sit and think. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Maybe if you could find some industrial waste. Exactly. <laughs> Definitely. Um, or, you know, find something to lay down on top of quietly. <laughs> yeah, have a little magic sense. <laughs> there you go. Um, our, the next movie we're going to talk about real quickly is the recent release from Pixar, and that is Incredibles 2. Uh, it is the sequel to the, of course, same name, The Incredibles. Uh, this one literally picks up seconds after the the first movie ends and finds the incredible family once again hit hit with the 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 government saying no we don't want superheroes around but a very rich benefactor and his sister find them and offer them a an option to kind of revitalize the brand of superheroes uh with with elastigirl the the 
Holly Hunter voiced character leading the way while Mr. Incredible stays at home with the with the kids as as they uh, you know go about the day to day. Lydia, both both you and I caught this this past weekend. Um, and you had some pretty strong feelings, I feel like, about Incredibles too. Uh, do you do, you, do you, can you whittle some of them down? <laughs> I wouldn't call them strong, more like confused. Okay, so like in contrast to the movie we were just talking about First Reform, which has like a very clear thesis and then sets about demonstrating it. I don't know what the fuck Incredibles 2 was about. Like way too much <laughs> was happening it felt totally unnecessary and like whiffling on any stance it set out to take i mean i guess the basic do you describe the plot it's like elastigirl's time to shine but she's chasing it's called the screen slaver is the villain i guess uh (laughs) and he hypnotizes people through their screens and makes a lot of comments and points about, oh, you spend too much time living in a simulation and relying on superheroes. But then it just kind of shies away from that, and then it does some stuff with Mr. Incredible, and it's I, that, that could be about something. I don't know. And then it goes back to like these rich tech siblings who are funding the whole adventure. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's. It, it's kind of one of those, and I saw somebody uh, put this as like a quick thought whenever they reviewed the movie right before it came out. But there, the pretty much the the thing that they said was Brad Bird has a lot of feelings about a lot of things, but does not know how to, whitt- you know, Mm-mm. bring them all down into one streamlined point. Uh, like, and that's and that's yeah. definitely true because yeah, you have this whole. Uh, you know, women being the breadwinner and men staying at home mm-hmm. storyline that they don't really ex- they, they kind of just get rid of relatively quickly once the yeah. the superhero y plot once kind the of kicks off. kicks off. Yeah, and then you have this villain who is is it seems to be talking about this kind of techno fever, which feels weird in a movie that has right? this retro nineteen fifties <laughs> look to it. But it feels like it's speaking to us in twenty eighteen about how screens are are taking away our agency and don't identity. Don't mean movie. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. The other thing that I don't know if if people have pointed out that I kind of took away was um, you have these two these two rich benefits factor pretty much uh yeah. played by Catherine Keener and Bob Odenkirk and it's interesting to have these two incredibly wealthy people who are kind of trying to befriend and put a lot of money behind um something in this case superheroes just a but, pet cause yeah yeah pet co- but it, it just there's something that rubs me the wrong way about you know how uh apple runs its business and amazon runs its business and yeah. and uh tesla runs its business and the people behind that and they're kind of um behind the scenes pring of how they are giving back and and helping yeah. the community and doing stuff like and that like, it, it, it it feels like i I, I for some reason felt it feels the, very cynical. Yeah, like, there's like as a plot device. Like the movie is counting on us knowing about. And but at the same time, suspicious. I don't think. Well, but I don't think Brad Bird is is saying that. Like I think he's definitely <laughs> saying the other things. Like he's clearly saying. I don't think he realizes that he's saying this about that he's like making this point about uh, tech people putting their putting their money behind pet causes. Like I don't think he that that I don't think that he registered that's a with good him. Thing. Yeah, I don't think that registered with him. I think he's 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 consciously going. I'm making a point about some of these things, but that one didn't seem to ring like it was a conscious decision just because while those other points were so muddily made there at least was a point where he you it felt like he was was sitting down in front of the screen saying this is what i'm saying with that one it seemed like he was just doing it and i was kind of like does he like know that he's making this point and it never goes anywhere and, and has never really um in, you know interrogated yeah and no it's it's so that, i that, think that's what made me so uncomfortable I, yeah you're exactly right <laughs> Like, what the movie thinks is bad is not necessarily what I think is bad. What the movie thinks is good, I'm like, nah, it's, nah. It's, a, it's a It's a movie... 
that that's trying to tackle mod- the modern age, but it's coming from like through this weird retro filter. Yeah, and, like and, someone... it, and it just and it feels and it just feels j- just overly preachy and like he's trying yeah. to he's trying to give us a message, but with no. With, but with a resolution that would like, make sense in the 1950s. Yeah, it, 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 it's not... There's no uh, there's no affinity or sympathy for, uh, you know, an upbringing or living in a modern age. It's more kind of going, well, you know, this stuff is there, but it's... And that's frustrating, but maybe we should just kind of, you know, keep that... It, you know, it, it feels like at the end they just want it to be a Norman Rockwell painting and... Uh, it kind of it's a, at at that point I was just like okay, um the now yeah, the the I, uh, the slapstick with Jack Jack the baby yeah, though Jack Jack a plus. That's my, I liked that a lot A plus <laughs> that was wonderful, um, but overall I this a is movie a very where con- he's friends with the raccoon and like they're frenemies and then they make friends and then they fight crime. Yeah, and and it's it's interesting. Uh, Courtney Anderson wrote about the movie for for Cinematary, and she talked about how she felt like it was a it was an improvement on like making sequels but i don't know to Mm. me it seems like especially with pixar and their non um toy story sequels have just it it, it just seems to me like there there really hasn't been a concrete idea or something that's well thought out (laughs) to make it's a reason to come back to that world other than they want to go back to that world and they (laughs) I, I don't At know. the beginning, they I had a thing. Obligatory plug from us. Yeah. Where all the actors came out and they're like, eh, it's been 14 years, such a long time, but here it is. You waited for it. And I was like, I don't think you were making this for 14 years. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, it just screams to me of, I, you know, I don't know. Cynical it, cash grab. Yeah, it, well, it, it's frustrating because Pixar has come out with, with, with solid stuff. I think uh, Coco last year is an original movie and it was really charming in, in a, in a kind of sweet underrated film uh inside out a few years ago you know is great and it's an original film um the good dinosaur we don't have to talk about but it's a movie <laughs> but at the, for, for the most part it just seems like this this idea of let's jump back in with sequels and then let's jump in with original movies i'm just kind of like at this point your picks are just make just make your original movies these 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 sequels just seem uh seem very tired and 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 kind of unnecessary and I mean, I'm sorry, Brad Bird, but I don't. It, it, it seemed more like you should have given a TED talk than made a movie about how screens are That's bad. I haven't seen this, but it's kind of disappointing considering that of all the Pixar movies, Incredibles seemed to be the only one that was actually, you know, kind of setting up a sequel. They dispense with that like immediately. Don't worry. Yeah, no, you know, it's true though. It is. It's, it's a movie that kind of sets up um, more, but it. It wasn't. It wasn't trying to explore more. It's. It's pretty much just a retread of what you got in Incredibles one. The. The. The dynamics of the family is. Is pretty identical, and so, it's. You know, while the Toy Story movies, it felt like they had their sequels and they had the the core idea of of these characters, but they really tried to expand and and explore. Um, much more but much more deeper emotional you know facets of, of of their of their characteristics this one just feels like it's kind of taking the it's copying the first one and just kind of continuing it and stretching it on and it really doesn't introduce anything that's like that's as that's, that's as interesting as what people you know took away from the first one yeah and uh, I didn't see it either but something I noticed is that they waited so long to release the sequel, they've kind of doubled their market in a way. So where you get, you know, kids who want to see the latest animated movie and then the kids who saw it originally yeah. back in 2004 or whatever. Yeah. The kids who saw it yeah. 14 yeah, years yeah. ago. All grown up now, you know, getting their tickets. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. still kids, it's, let's yeah. be honest. And it's also, worth, it's also for those. <laughs> Yeah. I did. And it's also <laughs> worth mentioning that, you know, that came, yeah, that came out in 2004. That's pre any of the real superhero things from Marvel and those mm-hmm. kind and so maybe maybe there is a little bit of that um, kind of blinders where that movie came out in 2004 and it was a it was a revelation then just because we had never seen a superhero movie um, 
it wasn't like superhero movies were just flooding the theaters constantly and now we're so overly saturated with the marvel movies and we just had infinity war which was this big overblown movie earlier this year where and so incredibles 2 comes out and there doesn't feel like anything revolutionary about it because we're like yeah we get eight of these a year uh it kind of just feels like another cog in the machine so yeah that's what's also still owned by disney (laughs) <laughs> that's true mm-hmm. um plus plus pixar has not had a great week in, ter- in terms of uh it's pr so uh a little a little weird <laughs> a little weird on pixar um but yeah incredibles 2 is in theaters now if, if if you are a fan of those we're gonna take a short break we will be back though talking kiss me deadly after this hello cinematary listeners this is andrew swafford with an important message during this break in the show Cinematary would like you to know that we do not want your money, and we don't want to place ads in the show at this time. That's not why we do this. We do it because we enjoy each other's company, and because we want to bring you our pure, unadulterated opinions on the world of cinema. However, there are a few things you can do to help out the show that we would greatly appreciate. Firstly, leave us a review on iTunes, preferably a positive one, uh, because the algorithm gods tell us that reviews increase our podcast exposure. Second, Secondly, send us a tweet at Cinematary, or better yet, send an email to Cinematary at Yahoo.com so that we can hear from you guys for a change. Maybe you think I'm an idiot for not liking Singing in the Rain, or maybe you have a suggestion of a movie that you really want to hear our opinion on. Regardless, let us know your thoughts, and we'll read them out and respond to them on future episodes of Cinematary. Finally, please share the show with friends and members of your family who you think would enjoy listening to and participating in our film discussions we bring to you guys every week so to recap uh, review send us your thoughts through twitter and email and share with your friends and family we would truly appreciate it thanks for listening now let's get back to the show night is mighty chilly and conversation seems pretty silly I feel so mean and rot I'd rather have the blues than what I've got the room is dark and gloomy don't know what you're doing. And we are back with part two of episode 201 of Cinematary. In this part, we will be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series with 1955's Kiss Me Deadly, uh, directed by Robert Aldrich from a screenplay by, and I love this name, A.I. Bezerides. Uh, the film stars Ralph <laughs> Meeker, Albert Decker, Paul Stewart, Cloris Leachman, Maxine Cooper, and Juano Hernandez. Shout out to our Intruder in the Dust episode. Uh, the story follows private detective Mike Hammer, who one evening picks up a strange woman who's standing on the highway wearing only a trench coat. They're stopped farther on by strangers who knock out Mike and murder the woman. Although warned not to investigate by the police, Mike and his girlfriend and, its, and assistant Velda become ensnared in a dark plot involving scientist Dr. Sobrin and the woman's terrified roommate, Lily. The great what's it, as Velda refers to the small mysterious valise at the center of Hammer's quest, is hot to touch and contains a dangerous glowing substance. It comes to represent the 1950s Cold War fear and paranoia about the atomic bomb that had permeated American culture by the time the film was made. Homage is paid to the glowing suitcase MacGuffin in the 1984 cult film Repo Man, the film Ronin, and in Tarantino's film Pulp Fiction. The shiny blue suitcase is mentioned with other famous MacGuffins in Guardians of the Galaxy. Galaxy. And I can't believe Nathan's not on this episode, but in the film Southland Tales, Richard Kelly pays homage to the film, <laughs> showing the main characters watching the beginning on their television, and later the opening of the case is shown on screens on board the Mega Zeppelin. Uh, the original novel by Mickey Spillan, which, while providing much of the plot, is about a mafia conspiracy and does not feature espionage and the mysterious nuclear suitcase. Elements added to the film version by the screenwriter. The film further subverted uh, the book by portraying the already tough Hammer as a narcissist narcissistic bully, the darkest anti-hero private detective in film noir. 
He apparently makes most of his living by blackmailing adulterous husbands and wives, and he takes an obvious sadistic pleasure in violence, whether he's beating up thugs sent to kill him, breaking a contact's treasured record to get him to talk, or roughing up a coroner who's slow to part with a piece of information. He also apparently has no compunction about engaging in nefarious acts, such as pimping his secretary. Bezerides wrote of the script, quote, I wrote it fast because I had contempt for it. I tell you, Spillane didn't like <laughs> what I did with his book. I ran into him at a restaurant and boy he did not like me um, the film's file in the MPAA PCA collection at the Ampus Library contains a September 10th 1954 letter from producer director Aldrich to PCA official Jeffrey Sherlock in which Aldrich states that he had recently been employed by Parkland Productions to produce Kiss Me Deadly and was aware that there were quote a number of problems inherent in the project in relation to securing code approval as noted in the letter Spillane's novel originally dealt with narcotics rather than atomic material and the organization fought by by Mike was the mafia, not an unspecified group of communists. In his letter, he expressed the hope that, quote, the property can be brought into line with the code in relation to narcotics and still not lose its dramatic oneness. In a September 20... 20- 20th 1954 memo from the files however it was noted that Aldrich was informed that a screenplay based on the novel could not be approved the two basic reasons for the story's unacceptability were the treatment of illegal drug traffic and its portrayal of Mike quote as a cold blooded murderer whose numerous killings are completely justified the PCA also objected to many instances of brutality and sex suggestiveness Aldrich was informed that if he intended to maintain the use of narcotics as a basic story motivation it would be necessary for him to appeal the decision of the code administration with the board of directors of the of this association in new york aldrich in turn told the pca that the filmmakers quote could easily overcome the problem of hammer acting as a murderous vigilante although they had not yet determined if they would retain the narcotics storyline uh, in November of 1954, he submitted a screenplay to the PCA, which was approved with a warning to be careful in the depiction of brutality and sex. The original American release of the film shows Hammer and Velda escaping from the burning house at the end, staggering into the ocean as the words The End come over them on the screen. Sometime after its first release, the ending was altered on the film's original negative, removing more than a minute's worth of shots where Hammer and Velda escape and superimposing the words The End over the burning house. This implied that Hammer and Velda perished in the atomic blaze and was often interpreted to represent the apocalypse. In 1997, the original conclusion was restored where Velda and Mike survive. The DVD release has the original ending and offers the truncated ending as an extra. According to a June 8, 1955 Daily Variety article, the picture faced further censorship difficulties when CBS TV censor Ed Nathan refused to allow the Los Angeles CBS station to air trailers for the movie. Nathan had publicly criticized the film, stating that it had, quote, no purpose except to incite sadism and bestiality in human beings. Bestiality? (laughs) Uh, According to film historian uh, Alan Silver, Kiss Me Deadly was Aldrich's favorite of his films. Uh, Film critic Nick Skanger wrote uh, of the film, Quote, never was Mike Hammer's name more fitting than in Kiss Me Deadly, Robert Aldrich's blisteringly nihilistic noir in which Ralph, star Ralph Meeker embodies Mickey Spillane's legendary P.I. with brute force savager. The gumshoe's subsequent investigation into the woman's death doubles as a lacerating indictment of modern society's desolation into physical, moral, spiritual degeneracy, a reversion that ultimately leads to nuclear apocalypse and man's return to the primordial sea. With the director's knuckle sandwich cynicism... Ah pummeling the genre's romantic fatalism into a bloody pulp. Remember me, Aldrich's sadistic fatalistic masterpiece is impossible to forget. A 1955 review by Variety says the ingredients that sell Mickey Spillane's novels about Mike Hammer, the hard-boiled private eye, are thoroughly worked over in this presentation built around the rock and sock character. Ralph Meeker takes on the Hammer character and as the surly hit first ask questions later, Sheamus turns in a job that is acceptable even if he seems to go soft in a few sequences on that note let's talk a little bit about kiss me deadly and i let's let's start first with um the first thing that i I really is the is the opening of this movie because uh it's 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 a great opening because you are hit with this scene where the chloris leachman character comes out in the middle of the road and mike hammer stops and, and brings her into the car and then you have this really strange um um, opening title sequence where it's kind of ba- it's ro- rolling yeah it's, backwards it's, it's, it's crawl. a backwards crawl
crawl. It's really, <laughs> it's really great. And then you kind of lead into the events that end with her murder. Um, what did you guys make of that opening? And it, it, it kind of just immediately just thrust you into this very, uh, very provocative, very, very hard hitting story. It like wrong foots you right at the beginning. <laughs> um, I was kind of mm-hmm. thinking about. Because I also read the comment by the screenwriter who's like, I wrote it really fast because I fucking hated it. That's that's not what he said. Uh, <laughs> but, and it, like, it's not quite a, like, revisionist noir, but by being just, like, a really, I don't know, honest representation, it sounds like, of the source material, like, whatever these novels are, it turns out to be pretty critical. And I maybe something about doing something weird with the titles is just like a little tip off like this isn't gonna be played straight or it is played straight but not in a way you're used to the straightest there's also the use of there's there's that Nat King Cole song over the title too which feels pretty unusual for noir to have like this uh because it's like a pop song playing over its credits no, yeah, I mean, I feel like the opening shows to tell you, like, everything's going to be backwards in this film, you know, everything's going to be, you know, stilted and disjointed, and I do kind of see this as, like, a deconstructionist noir, you know, in a way, even when he first picks up Cloris Leachman, you know, she's telling him, oh, you're one of those guys in a relationship that, you know, always takes, never gives, stuff like that, basically, you know, uh, describing the typical noir character, but instead we kind of see him as, like, this kind of contemptible and kind of petty and almost kind of uh, pathetic in some ways, just like in his profession. He's real stuff dumb, like that. right? Do you read poetry? Of like, course you don't. Oh, yeah. This Mike He's a dummy. Hammer guy. Like, I don't I don't really notice him solving this case with like really good <laughs> detective skills. <laughs> he, he just kind of smashes and uh, beats his way. <laughs> Into- He's a hammer. Oh my god! <laughs> Never He's mind. Like I'm done a, with that point. We got it. Smashing <laughs> a nail. <laughs> it's it's interesting that you that you mentioned that because uh, I was reading a a piece in Criterion for the release of the film, and they were talking about the performance. Um, by Meeker uh, as my camera, and uh, I did, th- this kind of just stuck out to me. The, mm-hmm. They say, on the face of it, the success of the performance is how shadow and opaque he makes Hammer, devoid of the interiority and psychological depth that are essential to noir. Yet there is more to Meeker, Meeker's subtle, detailed performance than slaps, smooches, and sadistic grins. In odd moments, he has a detached, quietly amused stance, as, as in his wonderful scenes with a philosophical movie man and a sheep, sheepishly crooked body. Boxing coach. When he goes to question a broken down opera singer, he nastily snaps one of the man's precious records, then roams around the room sampling his cheap wine, sniffing his spaghetti, fingering his hat. There's a childlike blend of selfishness and stubborn curiosity in his behavior. His attention is always oblique, yet he misses little. The world of Kiss Me Deadly is threatened not just by corruption or crime, but by impersonal, unstoppable forces of its atomic destruction, beside which Hammer's self centered neutrality seems small and even possibly sensible. Um. That scene where he snaps the guy's record was actually, I don't know, that that was the like little bit of violence that actually made me gasp. I was like, oh, shit. Because <laughs> he just like makes eye contact with the poor guy while he does it. <laughs> and it's probably the most violent thing he does. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Hammer's extra sadistic. I mean, also the scene where like he smashes... Uh, that guy's hand. That guy for the had key. it coming. <laughs> that guy had it coming, but like, like the way like he you know he, he just, just takes joy in it, and almost like the camera is like taking joy and like this, just this, it lets you see it straight up. Mm-hmm. It's you know it's sadism like pretty much unfiltered like a hundred percent, which is kind of unusual for these times. <laughs> I will, you know, it's kind of and that's why now. I think it's pointing towards like a revisionist or deconstruction or whatever, because a lot of the Westerns that also did this were just like totally stripping away any sort of romanticism or like mm-hmm. this is for a good cause or it justifies the mean. It's like, no, your protagonist is kind of kind of shitty. And this is who you're following and cheering for. But it doesn't it doesn't devoid it of any of the fun. <laughs> Like, I feel like a lot of revisionist Westerns kind of, they're like, why don't we just make this unfun or something kind of like that? 
this is miserable. This is miserable well, there's still a lot of, at least I had a lot of joy watching this movie, just maybe because of how over the top everything is. It reminded me of like Starship Troopers yeah. a little bit, like just by leaning right into the material and playing it basically straight. I, that is a little bit of a criticism in and of itself. It doesn't often work is the problem mm-hmm. with that style. So it's ambiguous, I think, what Aldrich and what's what's the screenwriter's name, Zach? AI Bezerites. <laughs> Bezerites. It Like if they achieve, a, I don't know. It seems like it was lost on a lot of people contemporary because they were just like, it's too violent. It's too sex. Which was maybe the point. Well, I think, like, unlike those revisionist westerns, which look, like, th- those look right. different. Or, or if you look at, like, the neo-noirs in, like, the 70s, those look yeah. very different from, like, the genre that they're deconstructing. You know, you get that, like, kind of grainy, like, 70s uh, look, and it's usually mm-hmm. in color and stuff. Like, this movie looks like a noir. And so I think it makes it even more, like, kind of jarring when you do see these kind of, like, out of the blue, like deconstructive elements, or just like the tropes of the genre pushed even further than normal. Because mm-hmm. you're, at least for me, like I'm kind of I've seen enough of these that I, I have a certain level of like expectation based on the aesthetics of a movie of what that movie's going to do, and this movie really just blows those up at like literally, <laughs> but also kind of figuratively, also bit by like smashing that dude's finger or like. At the beginning of the movie, or mm-hmm. near the beginning of the movie, um, like after he's woken up, um, he's like walking down the street and he gets jumped by this guy and he like punches the guy out. And normally, a noir movie would be like the dude gets punched out and that's kind of the end. But he like goes and like smashes yeah. the dude's head against the wall repeatedly until he's dead. And then dead. like throws him down like, the stairs yeah, and we just insane. watch him. Like, it, like it's a little yeah. cartoony. I, I was like, I, oh um, God. Yeah, and I feel like the I feel like this is more powerful, the critiques it's bringing, or maybe the revisionism. If it's bringing I, uh, critiques, I, I feel like right? it does. Again. I feel like it does, but it's at least it's happening during while noirs were still popular. At least a thing in theaters mm-hmm. like neo noirs, revisionist westerns, you know, come, you know, twenty years later, and you know, Aldrich, you know, kind of tackles it maybe head on, and maybe I, maybe I'm being a little generous towards you know its auto critique. You know, maybe it's not completely there. Maybe that's where some of the fun resides. Is it? still kind of delving into like these you know noir tropes yeah now lydia initially you weren't gonna be on this episode but (laughs) dylan moore you know frequent contributor on cinematary advised us that we should have a female voice for kiss me deadly after watching the movie did you do you understand why do you feel like they're like we love having you here, but like, do Thank you feel you. like there was a reason why we needed to have a female voice? Like, I don't. Did you? What did you make of that? I don't. Maybe Dylan was worried that just a bunch of guys wouldn't pick up on how shitty my camera treated basically every female he came in contact <laughs> with. But I, again, I feel like that was kind of the point of this movie, and it, because it puts such a fine point. Like, as soon as he meets a woman, like, the first thing he does is kiss her, and it makes me so uncomfortable. <laughs> I was like, please stop doing that. But I, but, You're going to have to specify, so, like, he kisses so many women in this all movie. All of them. Every single one. But, like, because it's so on the nose, I'm wondering, like, you guys would have yeah. picked up on that. I have faith in Just you. Just part of the job. <laughs> so, I like, maybe that's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's what Dylan was thinking. I'm glad I watched it because I just enjoy this sort of like genre exercise stuff anyway. Yeah, I, it was, I, it was just funny. <laughs> it, it was just, I'm always curious whenever he like, whenever somebody's like, no, you need to have, you know, a, you know, a male voice or a female <laughs> right. voice. Or, you know, so I'm always like, all right, well, let's see, like after watching it, do, do, do we figure out like why somebody would think that? So, um, now, I, I, we, we talked a, a lot about Meeker as, as Hammer. Um, what did you guys kind of make of some of these side characters? I'll say that I really, really loved um, Wesley Addy as the police lieutenant <laughs> because the way he delivered lines were, was just He's so... so contemptuous. <laughs> it was, and it was so just disinterested in trying to sugarcoat anything or, or make Hammer feel better. He was just like, I'm, I'm spitting you straight venom and I'm, I'm out of here. Like, just the, the way he delivered lines him and then, uh, 
And then the Paul roommate Stu- was so strange. <laughs> yeah, what did you make of her performance? She, she, she the uh, it, it is incredibly strange. I couldn't grasp, wrap my head around the way she was delivering <laughs> lines or like what she wanted or why she acted any of the way she acted. Like, did you think it was a yeah, bad she's got this performance? Weird accent. No, not bad, just strange, a little bit and, inexplicable. And she's, she's supposed to be like a femme fatale character, and like, I, I is in she? a way, or maybe I'm confusing ca- character. Not to, that's the one where she's. Yeah. The blonde girl who the, opens the Yeah, box yeah, she's kind of like because she's pretending to be the roommate, right? Or I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it's like Yeah, she's claiming to be the roommate so that she can get in the position mm-hmm. to I guess. So that's kind of that's kind of the femme fatale kind of aspect and like maybe that's I mean, like I said I might be too generous, but like just kind of the subversion of the femme fatale cuz everything is so Stilted and kind of awkward with her like, about her and, compared to like yeah. the sleekness and assured sexuality of you know the normal femme fatale. Because like when she kissed him or was trying to seduce him, I just felt so <laughs> awkward. I was like, she needs to go to bed. You need to leave. She got she got the <laughs> memo. She stop. was like, he's kissing all the women, so you gotta kiss him too. <laughs> kiss him first. That's the power play. Before you yeah, kiss exactly. him. Is, was that what it was? <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Even he was put off by it, though. He's like, okay, good I've, night. I've kissed so many women today. I Just not one more, please. <laughs> um, we've talked about it a little bit, but I guess let's go ahead and just dive into the to the ending of this movie because it's yeah. something. Uh, I, you know, I guess if, if, a little spoiler <laughs> alert if you, if you feel that way. It was made in 1955, so I apologize. But pretty much the end of this movie is uh, Hammer gets to this house where the, the communists are, and it is this roommate character. Was it communist? I communists? think they're supposed to be communists. We can we can get into that in a minute. Um, but it's, it's the doctor and okay. this roommate who have... have you know, stolen this box that everybody's been after, and she shoots the doctor and shoots Hammer, and begins to open the box, which just uh, you know shoots out this just fire and fire. It's it kind of feels like the uh, scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, except it's just fire. Um, mm-hmm. And then Hammer is 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 pulled out by Velda, and then we talked a little bit about at the beginning about how it ends, but. I don't know what what did you make of that because it switches from you know noir to oh this this box is spitting fire and is blowing up this house <laughs> well it's before that we see what's in the box before that ending it's like 30 minutes from the end of the movie where we see what's in the box right and the police inspector has to contemptuously spell it out for a poor dumb detective <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's the Manhattan Project, Rady. <laughs> Los Alamos. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. I thought so. This is um, the second time I saw this movie, and okay. I thought, like, looking through this or watching through this a second time, like that ending, or, or even just like the the twist that in the boxes is an unstable radioactive element. Like, I I thought maybe that would be. It would feel less shocking the second time around. And I guess it is kind of because I know it's coming. But the movie does not telegraph at all no. that this is what's in the box. And it's just a complete change of what's gears. What's in the box? <laughs> yeah, the, like, the science f- fiction aspect. And if I'm not mistaken, Aldrich did direct like some science fiction himself. So um, it kind of plays in into all you know his filmography. But um, I guess it kind of fits into the theme of like Hammer – you know the pretty much the villains and like the hero quote unquote hero of the movie kind of you know they fall prey to powers that are you know outside of their control and um you know what's a greater power than like a something that can destroy i don't know the whole world or something like that you yeah, know it it feels like a kind of natural endpoint for noir because you know it popped up after World War II and the atomic bomb, and it's like, oh god, we're in a very dark place now because of all this disruptive technology that we've harnessed. But I, this is the only noir I've ever seen that like directly put it on screen, like, oh yeah, nuclear destruction is th- just the logical endpoint for humanity. Everybody fucked up. Well, this is like one of the only noir kind of- that actually feel set in the cold war as opposed to some like nebulous like 1930s and 40s yeah 
It's it's funny that we're talking about this movie after talking about First Reformed in the second in the first part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, God forgive us for opening the box. Yeah. So, so two very different uh, main characters and their views on the the end of the world. You know, one doesn't even realize it might happen, and. Um, yeah, also, I, I found I mean, an interesting quote about uh, Kiss Me Deadly and like uh, Jacques Lorcelles, I think I'm saying his name right, uh, French critic. He said that uh, Kiss Me Deadly was a turning you know, point in American cinema from classical sincerity to like modernist irony, which I could totally uh. see his point. This totally, like, I mean, I'm, I might have to familiarize myself with more films of the area, era, but this has like a certain irony to the, you know, to it that seems pretty advanced for the time and to see like it seems like a lot of films took that brand of irony and you know used it in their own films well because it's kind of like if hammer had just left well enough alone it, nothing would have come of the investigation like nobody would have found the box or whatever is but like he very specifically says at one point he's like you told me not to look into this so guess what i'm gonna do <laughs> and it's like no don't be that way yeah, and that's like kind of the the deconstruction of the noir detective. You know, they had to put their nose into something, you know, so that they could solve it. Well, you know, he just kind of makes matters worse as, you know, as uh, time goes on. Basically. I mean, people have like uh, leveled that criticism at, I don't know, Rages of the Lost Dark. Like, oh, if Andy hadn't done anything, nothing would have changed because they still open it and it melts their faces, whatever. But, like, if Hammer hadn't done anything, I don't think they would have found it. <laughs> like, maybe he wouldn't have caused the apocalypse. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's I kind of want to see a double feature of this and Hail Caesar when it comes to, <laughs> it comes to, 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 to that whole thing. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess kind of just to wrap up some final thoughts. Uh, we've talked we've talked a little bit about Aldrich, um, in, in but I, I don't know if we've talked necessarily aesthetically about some of the stuff that he does in this film. And it, it's a very interestingly directed m- movie. I, mm-hmm. I, the camera really kind of yeah, the camera really moves around freely and it, and it and it feels. I saw somebody describe it as it feels more like a like a noir that you would see like in the seventies rather than being in nineteen fifty five. It feels very ahead of its time. Uh, I mean, is, the, mm-hmm. is that something that you guys kind of picked up on? Do you, do you feel just outside of the the narrative structure that um, aesthetically it feels like something uh, revolutionary? The editing feels kind of like there'll, there'll be scenes like the fight scenes specifically. Like if you look at old noirs, like a lot of those, like the punches are one take, right? You like punch the guy and he falls down in the same shot. Whereas in this movie, like someone will throw a punch and there'll be a cut and, to where we see like the the camera angle like has changed. And I there's just something kind of dynamic about like the way that the like the edits work uh in relationship to the characters in this movie that doesn't feel classically Hollywood. And whenever I see like a movie from this era, which I assume is like all studio movies, and I think Aldrich's kind of like a journeyman director, right? Well, this is independent. I, uh, I don't know if this was an RKO film, but whenever I see handheld yeah, United Artists. camera movements, uh, like it always jars me in like the 40s and 50s or whatever. So I'm like, I always assumed everything was very carefully set up and then they i don't know it just looks rougher totally i feel like um those scenes where you know the the greater power i don't even know what to call them um this but like especially when they first uh um get uh, the chloris leachman and uh my camera character and like somewhat kidnap them and stuff like that uh you only really see their feet or anything which i feel is like almost like a science fiction cue or maybe just other science fiction um, projects have taken cue from this film, possibly. I'm not sure, you know, which is which, but like that, that's a very science fiction kind of the withholding of like these mystical sort of creatures, you know, there's not to take the, the mystery away from them. Repo Man definitely took from Kiss Me Deadly because Alex Cox even has like a little video thing on the Criterion version. Going back to the, uh, like what you were talking about, the, um, you know, it being studio or not. Um, I'm looking here, the budget, at least just on the Wikipedia page, says it's uh, $410,000, which if you look back at like, like Ace in the Hole is a noir from the early 50s, that's 
over a million dollars in budgets. Uh, Double Indemnity was almost a million dollars as well. So like this movie was made kind of on the cheap, I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I think it is independent because I, I'm, uh, it said United Artists at the end. And I feel like that's what a lot of Samuel Fuller's movies was made on uh, United Artists. And I think that's independent. Like, like I said, I'm yeah, not sure. United but. Artists is owned by the like the artists, right? It's sort of like a, the credit mm-hmm. union of movie studios. Should bring that back. Any uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I think it's really fun. I'd recommend this to people, especially maybe people who don't love noir because it's not the noriest noir no. <laughs> I've ever seen. But it still like engages in the tropes and then does something actually really unexpected and interesting with it. Yeah, totally. I'd, I'd recommend this too. Um, you know, pretty much for all the points you said also just one tidbit but i love his giant answering machine i've never seen anything like that before <laughs> <laughs> with like the real to real tape that, that worth the it for the giant answering <laughs> the machine below. i think it's on youtube well, so like how does that answering machine work because like when he plays it there's a woman's voice saying you have you know a, a message or something is that his secretary yeah. velda he a really like nice place like that, he must or? have been making a lot of money because the car that got destroyed was a jag and then he's got this like fancy technology <laughs> for the time in his house i don't that's suspicious i'm suspicious yeah i don't really yeah know. it almost reads like um you know like in offices like secretaries used to leave like the little notes on the on the desk where it's like you know while I, you're away like you had a, a call from so and so and it I feels guess. like someone's like reading that dictation on she also says, while you were away, this is the message, which I thought was kind of strange. It was like Siri. It feels like retro futurism, which doesn't really make sense, but like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like Jetsons. Like, like they're oh, inventing and, this technology um, as... Yeah. All right. I had this thought in my head. I just had to get it out before the episode <laughs> ended because it's kind of ridiculous. But like... Like, I kind of... Like, this is a stretch, but like, I kind of feel like the movie Crank kind of draws a lot from this movie just because of just like the manic Los Angeles energy, just kind of like something that's so nonstop. So, you know, unrelentingly violent, you know, I mean, kind of ends with like the character kind of dying in a way. Not really. I guess he gets away, but like, I mean, they do make a point of my cameras. Like you could have died in that car accident. You're back from yeah. the dead. LOL. So, yeah. Maybe just a, a slight Craig comparison there. Slight. <laughs> Neville Dean and Taylor are Altrich fans. They gotta be. They gotta be. <laughs> I think my favorite line of the entire movie was when he was in the car with Cloris Leachman at the beginning, and she's like, "I bet you do push-ups every morning to to get that you know fit physique." And he goes, "What's wrong with a little bit of exercise and and <laughs> health?" He's right. He's right. I, I yeah, defend him I on that. I was like, point. "That's true." <laughs> Like, what's wrong with a little exercise and health? <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I, I, I will uh, add to that. I really recommend uh, checking out Kiss Me Deadly. It actually, if you would like, I watched it, um, the full movie in HD. The HD Criterion version is on YouTube. So Same. Uh, there you go. Free, free way to watch it. World's best streaming <laughs> oh, sure. site, YouTube. I swear by it. It's it's been helping us a lot on this Young Critics this series at least this year. I've watched a lot of stuff on YouTube. I don't know. Same. Yeah, whatever. Um, all right. Well, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary on Twitter at handle at cinematary and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary where we post all of the movies that we talked about in this episode. Next week, we will be joined again by a guest. We're going to be talking about 1955's Pather Panchali and Gira Shambu is going to be returning to the podcast. He came on a, a year and a half Yay. or so ago. Um, he's going to be... He's so nice. He's very nice. He, he's going to be talking about, he wrote about the film for the Criterion Collections, uh, the Apu Trilogy Pack. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I caught this movie uh, last year and was like, this is immediately like, oh yeah, this is one of the best movies ever. Um, so I'm, And you have an essay about it on our site in our retro reviews, right? Yes. I, I, I wrote a little bit about the about the series at large. So I recommend, you know, hopefully hopefully people uh, will, will check that one out and then and watch the rest of those of those movies. But I, I'm, I'm excited for this chat with Gearish. So uh, something to look forward to. We, we, we just have a, you know, we have about 
a month or month month or so left of the Young Critics series. So still some good stuff on the way. Uh, and then on the Cinematary website, we got reviews of Hereditary. Uh, we have a review of Incredibles two. We have a review of American Animals. Um, so lots of lots of good stuff coming up. You can, you can check it out on the site. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. I wanted to take one final moment to remind you to check out Audible and get a free 30-day free trial just for being a listener of Cinematary. You can start your trial by going to www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary and picking through over 180,000 titles that can be accessed from your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, or even your MP3 player. Again, that link is www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. See you next week.